If a player cleans his ball during play of a hole, except on the putting green, he shall incur a penalty of one stroke. That's a rule, Jerry. But it's just a friendly game. Why do you always have to be such a stickler? Because that's the way I was raised. Welcome to Spirit of the Game, brought to you by the Colorado Golf Association. Here are your hosts, Ed Mate and Lewis Harry. All right, we're back for another another edition of Spirit of the Game. Uh, I am so delighted. This is Ed Mate coming to you live from our podcasting studio. We have some very special guests today, um, and uh, I'm glad. I'm amazed our calendars worked because these two are very busy, both playing golf, officiating, and that is the one and only Bob and Christy Austin, or Christy and Bob. I don't know what the right order is. Uh, the first lady and first gentleman of the rules of golf in the state of Colorado. Thank you guys for coming in. Well, thank Happy you for here. thank you for yeah. having us, Ed. It's yeah. uh, it's our it's our pleasure and honor. Well, when 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 I get when we do these monthly uh, talks, mainly Lewis and I, I'm apt to get a couple of comments, and usually one of them's from Bob Austin. <laughs> so I appreciate. it. I've always said we have one listener, and maybe two now. We're gonna have a, we're gonna win over another <laughs> listener here. I do so, I do listen to your monthly podcast. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> All right, one thing I heard. Uh, recently, we do have to set the stage, but the, what I heard recently is get right to the best question. Don't wait around. So I'm not going to delay. I'm going to go right in there. But we do need to explain for those that aren't in the inner circle um, who you guys are. So let's start with you, Christy. Tell us about your background in golf and how you became uh, involved with the USGA and um, rules officiating specifically. How much time do you have, Ed? No, yeah. <laughs> uh, I didn't play the game till I got married. So I got married in 1982, took up the game, uh, started playing and competing shortly after that. Um, so, And I still do when I have time. But I got involved in rules and the USGA when I was admitted to the board in 2007. I had never officiated before that. The board of the USGA. The board of the USGA. The Which is a pretty, board. it's a pretty prestigious thing. Well, not very many people get... Uh, it's not like a board of a hundred. It's a board of very small. Yeah. It is. And, and it was pretty shocking that I was asked, but I think I brought things to the table that they maybe hadn't seen from at least the, the four women that preceded me. So I was yeah. the fifth woman in 114 yeah. years. Now there's more women that are actively involved, but back then it was pretty rare. But as you can uh, relate, my very first rules assignment, once I was on uh, the executive committee, was Augusta. I went to Masters, and I'm sitting in the rules meeting, and they hand out the assignments. And lo and behold, Christy Austin is assigned to the 18th green on Sunday by myself. <laughs> and I looked around and thought, this has got to be a typo. I mean, <laughs> do they know who I am? <laughs> but I'm not. So I quickly recruited the head of the Japanese tour, who was on the second hole, to come sit with me after his hole was completed. So Very smart. Yes, half the round I had an expert sitting next to me. Uh, so I quickly realized if I'm going to officiate at this highest level, I better get good at the rules. What year was that? That was 2007. Okay, yeah. So in 2008, I went to my first rules workshop. and then So you actually were doing that even before you'd been to a rules yes. workshop? Wow. And, yeah, and then 2009, I was expert qualified. So I yeah. really stepped it up quickly yeah. because... That'll, of, that'll, yeah, that'll get you motivated. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. And so I've been officiating... Uh, USGA championship since 2007. I've done 70, 70 as wow. of today and 72 at the end of this year. I have two more to go. So I've done it a lot and I still enjoy it. And even after I rolled off in, in 2013, I'm still actively involved. I do two or three or four a year. Mm -hmm. And and it's fun because Bob and I do it together. So we coordinate some of our trips, uh, some of our championships as we can. And this year, we were fortunate enough to go to the U.S. Open at Pinehurst. Yeah. We just got back from Pinehurst doing that together. Okay. Really well, I'm going to have a lot of questions about that. So Okay. Okay. Now, that's a tough act to follow, Bob. I know you're used <laughs> to it. But tell us about how you started in golf. I imagine you started before you married Christy. Um, but tell us about how you started and how you got involved in the rules. Yeah, I... Uh I grew up playing. I was I was um, fortunate. Uh, I, I uh, <clears throat> played since I was a little kid, and always loved the game, and was always uh, very interested in the rules. And um, as far as the rules side, about two thousand and three or two thousand and four, there was a three and a half day rules workshop 
in Denver, and a friend of mine said, uh, geez, they have this three-day rules workshop. And I thought, well, I'm pretty good at the rules. <laughs> I think I've got to go to that workshop. And I did, and I got slaughtered. And uh, as most people do the first time they're at the workshop. Um, but I thought I could be pretty good at this. Um, and, um, and so I started kind of doing a, a couple little events and studying the rules really hard. And the third year I went to rules school, I got a 99. And um, I, through a connection that I knew, a gal asked me to officiate at the Women's Amateur Public Links um, in Wisconsin. So I was invited to that and went to the Women's Amateur Public Links and then got on the Women's Amateur Public Links Committee. I was one of the first three men that ever served on a ladies committee at the USGA. And from there, I went to the junior and, you know, I just keep still working hard. And um, we I got on the right we uh, and at this point, I've worked not as many as Christy, but I've worked around 55 USGA events. And then we also work five or six college events. And we've we've worked, um, I think, 10 to 12 NCAA finals, both for the D1 women and the D1 uh, men. And we, uh, Christy ran a regional this year and I ran a regional a few years ago. So we're very involved in the, and we travel to various places, but we also do the Palmer Cup um, and we also do the um, international team. So, you know, we're, we're blessed that uh, we travel around and as Christy said, most of the events uh, we go together, but but not all. But I still I still love the study of the rules. I've been to rules school twenty years in a row. Um, work very hard at it. Um, it's nice to have Christy to uh, bounce ideas off of. But you know, one one thing in in my golf uh, is I'm the head golf coach at Kent Denver High School, and this is I'm going into my twentieth year of coaching. So. And the first Monday in August, the high school season starts. And so for uh, August and September and a, a week or two in October, um, I don't officiate. Um, I'm all in with Kent Denver, and that that's my number one priority. But And I drive my uh, players absolutely crazy. I try to teach them about rules. They never quite like that. <laughs> I'm sure that, they but, love that, yeah. But it's... it's uh, it's you know we're we're very blessed and and you know this the whole experience, um, the, the whole experience of of the friends that we've met through the USGA and the NCAA and the associations and um, I want to talk later about we saw two of uh, the of of those that you had mentored um, along the way nice. at the U.S. Open. So I want yeah. I, I I do want I will talk about that that a little later. Yeah. But uh, okay. first of all, Ed, we really appreciate uh, you being here. We know uh, you've served on the Rules of Golf Committee, and you're certainly a, one of the rules minds and and one of the people in golf we we look up to greatly. So it's a big honor for us to be here. Oh, with that's, you. that's very nice of you. Um, Boy, there's so much there to react to, but let's let's. As I promised, I wanted to jump in with maybe the best question that most of our four listeners now want to hear. Uh, you just came back from the U.S. Open, so let's talk about Pinehurst um, um, a little bit. But I'm going to even go back. Did you have anything happen there? So this is a two-part question. I'm going to start with Christy, and then we'll go to Bob, uh, and we'll mix this up to so keep you on your toes. What rulings did you? First of all, just talk about being at Pinehurst. You can answer that, I guess, you know, what the how the whole process works, how you're assigned to holes. I've had the good fortune of being on your email list, so I get a nice insight. Not everybody gets those. Um, and then any rulings you made. And then I want you to be thinking, so I'll plant the seed, the most nervous you've ever been as a rules official. So that's really my first question. But I want to start with Pinehurst because we just wrapped up a U.S. Open. So just talk about your experience there. Sure. Uh, we received our assignments a few days before we headed out, and so we knew what holes we would be on. And what they do is assign you a position on a hole. If it's a par three, you're the only one on there. Sometimes on a par four, you're the only one on there. Typically par fives, there's somebody in the landing area and somebody on the green. So I had a landing area the first day, and I, I had a rule, lots of rulings on. Uh, it was the fourth hole. Um, it, Pinehurst is a very interesting golf course from aesthetically. I think if, if your listeners have uh, viewed the coverage, there's just bunkers everywhere. And mm -hmm. some of them are bunkers and some of them are waste areas. And sometimes they're connected. 
Mm -hmm. And that was one of the rules challenges that we that we faced that week. Uh, I worked par three, and I worked two other holes where I was on the green. So I had a lot of a lot of uh, viewing of players finishing their holes on on, mm -hmm. uh, on the greens, which is always really interesting. Typically, that we didn't have a lot of rulings there other than TIOs. There was a lot of TIOs, but they what, were what set back. What are TIOs, honey? Oh, do you not know that? I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a TIO is a temporary immovable obstruction, and the grandstands and the camera stands and the lots of cabling uh, are all considered objects that are in the way but aren't typically a challenge on a golf course. So we, we grant players relief if they uh, have interference or... Uh, line of sight interference. So anyway, grandstands were really yeah. the main thing, but they were set back enough and there was long grass in front of them that, that they didn't get back there that often. But the bunkering on four, I gotta just tell you real quickly about uh, a couple of rulings I had since you asked. The, I had a uh, number four fairway landing area on the first day. And on the right side of the fourth hole, there's two large bunkers separated by a saddle that's sand, so that's waste area. So it's bunker. All contiguous. All right. contiguous. <laughs> yeah. Bunker, waste area, bunker. And I can't tell you how many balls were borderline yeah. on the line where it would be maybe bunker or maybe they could ground their club because it was waste area. So I, after I watched this hole being played out in the, in the first few groups that came through, and by the way, we had that one all day. Mm -hmm. So two rounds. So we were out there a long time. Uh, I would just tend to, if I saw a ball that was questionable at all, I would walk over, look at the ball. And as the player was walking up, and by the way, one of the players that was in this situation was Dustin Johnson. Mm -hmm. And I said, Dustin, you are not, your ball is not in the bunker. And the, the players appreciate that. I took mm. sort of a proactive <laughs> Particularly <approach>. Dustin Johnson. <laughs> Particularly Dustin, right. <laughs> little history there with you bunkers. Know, sometimes <laughs> you wait until you're asked a question, but I... I knew that if I were a player and I was in a situation where I didn't know, I would like to know. Yeah. And I wouldn't have to go around and look around for an official and call somebody over for that. So I took a fairly proactive uh, approach and said, your ball's in the bunker or your ball's not in the bunker. And they just say thank you. And how did you determine that? Was there... The, there's, there's a pretty distinctive line. Yeah. Um, where, and of course, the, the waste area is not maintained. Right. And the bunkers are maintained, right? right? So in the morning, and, in the, and then the, the um, caddies maintain them throughout the day. You can tell when they're in the bunker. But there was a couple of times when it was uh, on, the, on the edge of the bunker and the waste area, and typically those weren't maintained. So, I, yeah. you know, it, it, it was a judgment call for sure, but yeah. you could pretty much But you tell. could be in a situation where it's right on that cusp, and the ball's in a footprint, or I guess that wouldn't matter. You still have to deal with it either way. But there might be a big, that might be a significant yeah. advantage or disadvantage, depending on where you are. Yeah, and one of the things that I struggled with watching that whole play out, and I called the um, PGA Tour professional, Stephen Cox, who was my rover. I said, Stephen, that is that waste area in the middle is really getting beat up. There's just tons of footprints, because they were throwing the rake on the other side mm. of not in the fairway side, but the waste area side. So the players would wander, not the players, the caddies would wander through this saddle, grab the yeah. rake, but they weren't correcting their footprints yeah. at all. So it got worse and worse and worse. So by the end of the day, if you were in that saddle, you typically had a very bad lie. And did that happen? Yes, it yeah. did happen. And yeah. so I had a theoretical discussion with him about what Can should I, we be doing? Yeah. And he said, you know, Christy, we can't maintain all these waste areas. Yeah. We just let them just go. Let them. But I did talk to another rover. This is very. This is why it's subjective. I talked to another rover later, and he said, "I probably would have tidied it up a little bit." Yeah. So there's a d difference of opinion. Interesting. There. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bob, how, what what was your experience at this year's Open? You know, um, I had some interesting ones. And you know, first of all, when you go to an Open, there's just a lot of stuff on the golf course. There's the the rope lines and there's concession stands and there's tee markers and there's everything and one of the challenges is the rules official is some of those are movable obstructions and some of them are, are immovable obstructions and temporary some of them are temporary immovable obstructions and some of them are just integral where you mm -hmm. just play in it so at that level you better get it straight but um 
I had a very interesting ruling. Um, I had a player, Luke Luke um, Clinton, um, Clanton. Clanton, excuse me, Luke Clanton, who was an, an amateur, who was, I was sitting on the 10th hole, that embedded the ball in the the way in the sandy area off the fairway, but right in one of those um, what were those plants wire, called? Uh, the wire grass. The, the wire. wire grass, right in the middle of the wire grass. He must have hit the shot, high shot, and it it just um, went straight down, and it was embedded into this wire plant. Well, as you know. Um, that if it's in a sandy area, not cut the fairway height or less, you do not get free relief for an embedded ball. And so he came over and the caddy came over, and we know Luke a little bit from co- his college days, and I denied relief for an embedded ball. Well, he wanted a second opinion. His caddy really wanted a second opinion, so I called it, guess who came in as my rover and gave me a second opinion? Pete Liss. How about that? Small world. <laughs> Pete Liss, who came in, who who is on tour and certainly one of the one of the one of our alums, one of the yeah. alums. Uh, Ed Mate had hired him and mentored him, and you know, a few years later, he's he's out on tour, um, and so he came over and took him about five seconds and said, uh, "We're playing everything off the fairway as a sandy area, so no yeah. relief." Yeah, but then. So he was sort of grumpy about it, but he takes he decides to play it, and he takes this mighty swing at it, and he hits it over a corporate hospitality hut that was probably sixty feet high. I mean, he hit that ball, and he's he's fifty yards, forty yards from the green, and he probably hit it seventy yards over the green. Wow! And I was worried because there was a lot of other stuff back there. If we couldn't find the ball. Mm. You know what? What we're going to do, and is it? Do we have virtual certainty it's somewhere? Or are we just playing stroke at distance, which would be challenging? And but he found it. We found the ball, and Pete came cut over, <laughs> and I didn't need his help. Now he, group Pete, was on the clock. Now, <laughs> yeah, for, that's yeah. right. Yeah. And so I, uh, I uh, just you know helped him. You know, on the temporary move. That, that's a temporary movable obstruction where you get relief to the side. More than one club length, less than two, is a pretty easy. Once I found the ball, it was actually a pretty easy ruling. But it was it was kind of fun. It kind of fun to bring in Pete, who, you know, he he certainly, you know, glows when I mention your name. Ed. Oh, that's nice. So um, I teased it, so we might as well. Uh, nerve most. You probably, I'm going to guess, Christy. Maybe that first Masters was when you were most nervous. You've seventy championships later. You, you know. I know what it's like, and I know that you're definitely. I, my rule of thumb is I don't want to become famous because there's no such no good kidding. thing. Good thing is a famous rules official. If you become famous with clubs in your hand, that's great. But when you become famous with a radio <laughs> in your hand, wrong. that yeah, is it's, not it, it's, good. It's, it's really so, your inf- infamous. I yeah, think. I always say, you know, you, I always use the term Motorola rights. Anything you say can and will be held against you when you get on that radio. So anything come to mind for, I'll start again well, with you, Well, I think you're right. I think the most nervous, I mean, I'm really not, I don't really get nervous anymore because I, I'm confident that I, right. that I know. And if I don't know, I've got professional rovers right there. Right, right. But was, was at Augusta on the 18th hole that, that when I had balls all the time in somebody's lap or in one of those chairs or leaning against the chair. So we, I was constantly moving gallery, mm-hmm. constantly have players either drop or place depending on where the ball was. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so just being in that limelight was, was nerve wracking because it was my first Game. Yeah, yeah. Um, but since I mean, I've had some, I've had some interesting rulings. I had one at the uh, Open Championship at Royal Lytham with Jimenez, mm-hmm. and he's an interesting character. Yeah. He speaks, I, and I've walked with him enough at senior championships that he speaks English. Yeah. But when he hit his ball, it, he embedded his ball, and we were not playing. This was back in the day. Yeah. And they had a difference of right uh, embedded ball in close simone areas or or everywhere. The right. tour, the European tour played, if you embedded your ball anywhere, you're going to get relief. Mm-hmm. Well, this was the RNA. This was the, the championship that did not play that. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the players don't really know. They don't read the notice to right. the notice to competitors. So he embedded a ball, and I and he's literally got his fingers almost to the ball. And I said, on hell, are you identifying your ball? Because I'm afraid he's going to lift it without mm-hmm. having any reason to lift it. And then we got another situation, right? right? Another problem. 
he looks at me crazy, like I'm crazy. He said, you're identifying your ball, right? And he said, yeah, yeah. And, and so he lifted and says, yeah, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move it. I'm going to take relief. Well, you're not entitled to relief. We have to replace that ball. And he about, you know, took my head off. Yeah. And I was trying to explain to him why. And, he, and I said, would you like a second opinion? He said, absolutely. And, of course, he didn't speak English for a while when I'm in the middle of talking to him. Yeah. But now, now Slugger comes over and says, Slugger, I'm afraid Christy's right. You're, you, you don't get relief. We're not playing that you get relief if you're embedded in, in, the, yeah. uh, in the rough. And uh, so now he was cursing in his uh, language. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I had to walk with him the rest of the day. And uh, coincidentally, David Duval was in that same group. And of course, David yeah. and I go way back to yeah. 1990 Amateur when we stayed at our house. So uh, David and I know each other well. But I told him, I said, the best thing you can do for you is go into scoring and talk to David Rickman about this situation and how it's not equitable. And you really don't think that was, that right. was fair. Yeah. Because soon after, as you know, uh, they changed the they yeah. they revised that rule yeah. uh, the embedded ball rule. So anyway, that was fairly controversial just with that player, even though I was right. right. Yeah. Um, How about have you ever been on? I'm sure you have, but have you ever known you're on camera where there's like there's definitely a camera on this ruling right now? I just know it, and it, we were aware of that. Yes, several. I mean, one. In, I mean, I, I mean, Bob. What's the most famous one? I suppose. <laughs> Ricky Fowler at the Walker Cup. Yeah, she was on TV for 10 minutes with uh, uh. at the Walker Cup with Ricky Fowler giving him embedded ball ruling. But, you, you know, a lot of times, for example, you know, we've both were fortunate enough to, uh, I walked in the semifinals or refereed the semifinals in the amateur, and Christy did the final, first round of the finals. And you know, you know, there's yeah, so many cameras that if you're making a ruling there, yeah. um, that every, you know, it's the, it's uh, it's going to be on TV. And and we've also had the fortune to walk in the fu- with the finals of the women's NCAA's. Mm-hmm. A matter of fact, I had Jennifer Cupcho's last round where she lost in extra holes. Um, and oh, yeah. there's a couple rulings down the stretch, and you know there's a lot of cameras around. Right. So you you do know, and then it's also funny, Ed. When you're on TV, and I guess I was on TV with Cameron Young at the Open, you have your cell phone in your pocket, and you feel it like, going oh, zip, zip, zip. zip. <laughs> it's all your buddies. All I see my, you, Bob. All my friends are texting me, and I'm like, uh-oh, this I must good. be on TV. <laughs> <laughs> so it gives you a little clue. I had a ruling with Neil Shipley, who won, who was a low amateur at the at. At Pinehurst, that was quite a drama with the two. It was, he and the, who was Yeah, that was came. Luke Clanton. Oh, that was Luke Clanton, right Luke, down to the, the yeah. One that, okay, know, went over the, the yeah. They wanted relief. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, but Luke, or I'm sorry, Neil was um, hit his approach shot onto this par four, and it, as usual on a lot of those greens, it rolled back off mm-hmm. the green twenty yards, a mm-hmm. long ways, and he's getting ready to hit his third shot. And I'm watching him from where I'm sitting. I'm watching him, and he's going like this, and then he stops and, you know, sort of mm-hmm. looks at his caddy. And so now I'm heading over because I know something happened. And I'm halfway there, and he waves me over. And I know Neil from um, several other uh, championships we've worked and the amateur. How can I help you, Neil? And he said, uh, Christy, I was taking practice strokes, and my ball rotated a half a ball. I mean, it definitely moved. I said, okay. But he said, but I don't think I caused it to move. I said, okay, Neil. I said, did you ground your club behind the ball? No, I didn't ground my club, but I'm taking practice swings. And when he showed me where he was taking his practice strokes, it was fairly close to the ball, close enough that he Mm -hmm. could have caused it to move. I said, how about this, Neil? And there's a camera crew right there, Mm -hmm. and there's a cameraman watching. I said, why don't we call for video evidence and see if there's any uh, any more information that we can gather by having them take a look at it? He said, that's great. Let's do that. So I called, and meanwhile, I'm the radio's full of pace of play chatter, and I'm mm-hmm. trying to get in. But he, they radioed back and said, we we uh, we do have that, and Neil, we are saying Neil caused that ball to move. Really? So I said to Neil, I said, Neil, they're confirming that you caused that ball to move. And he said, okay. And I said, and it's a one-stroke penalty. We need to replace the ball. And so he replaced the ball, you know, went on to make a double, which was really unfortunate. The funny thing is he was walking. This was the 13th hole. He's walking on the 14th fairway after he's driven the ball, and he waves me over again. 
And he says, now, um, was that a one-stroke penalty or a two-stroke penalty? I said, Neil, it's a, only a one-stroke penalty. He said, okay, my walking score thought it was two. I'm like, uh, okay, all right, yeah. well, it's only one. Was this the final round? <laughs> this was uh, the final. Uh, no, it wasn't. Okay. It was the. It was on Saturday. Uh, yeah. You know, you know, Ed, just as a, a counter to that, <clears throat> one of the most significant changes in the 2019 rules was that if a ball at rest moves to to have it be deemed that it's the player who caused it to to move it has to be virtually certain that the player caused it to move and before then if you grant you know there was went through a time that if you grounded your club even though you didn't touch your the ball you could be um, deemed guilty but well even if you moved a loose impediment within a club length you were deemed to have caused it to it, the move it, it even was if it had nothing to do with the movement of the ball. It, so, you're yeah. right. And, and you know, it used to be before 2019, you were sort of guilty until you were proven innocent. Yeah. But the, that was a very significant kind of under the radar, not very much talked about, that for a ball ball arrest to be moved to, to penalize the player, it has to be virtually certain the, the player caused it. Well, and it's, it's so interesting the, the way you handled that because I think if you took – uh, you know, 100 rules officials, all of whom are rule certified, all of whom maybe not as experienced as you are, because I think this is where your experience came in. Their inclination might be, I think a lot of, first of all, the average player, person would say, well, no, you didn't cause it to move. You, you didn't. So you just, and you want to be nice. You just don't right. want to. But uh, I'm not sure, again, I'm a little rusty and I haven't worked nearly as many championships as you guys have to know. And again, in this day and age of, of video evidence, to make that call. It never would have entered my mind mm. to have done that. And obviously if I was well-versed and trained, I probably would have been instructed that if you have a doubt, um, but I'm, you know, that's, I, that's impressive to me that you got on the radio to ask that question. Cause I would have probably, cause what I would have done in those situations is look, I'm over here. You're the one that has to live with this. Did you cause the ball to move? And I made that ruling many times. Um, and just said, you're the, I always say right. you're the one who's, Head's going to hit the pillow tonight. You're going to have to live with whatever decision you make. And that's a good uh, point. I, you know, knowing Neil and really liking Neil Shipley, he plays for or played for Ohio State. Um, really super nice guy. Was the uh, not the winner, but the, the finalist, finalist uh, for, in, yeah. in the Cherry Hills uh, Am, and we and we housed him in a home that was Ohio State player. So I mean, he goes way back in our life, and we love him. But my inclination at first was just to say, gosh. Okay, Neil, you didn't cause it. I mean, exactly. I, back in my mind, I'm yeah. like, oh God, I don't want this to be real. I don't want yeah. him to have moved his yeah. ball. But I knew that there was video evidence because I was watching the cameraman, and the, you know, I, yeah. I just knew there was cameras all around him, and I just felt. Would like you have thought of that, Bob? That Would was, you? Yeah. As a matter of fact, um, I actually called for video evidence um, with Cameron Young, brought me over coincidentally about an hour before Christie's. And he was in the deep grass, and his ball was kind of in deep grass. And he said he, he took a practice swing, and he, he hit one of the grasses, and he said, you know, my ball wiggled, but I wasn't sure mm -hmm. it, if, it, if it had moved. And I said, uh, would you like me to call for video evidence? So I had actually done the same thing. In this case, he was one of the first guys out on the course. I was on 10, and I called um, Craig Winter, who was – on the TV broadcast, and we did not have video evidence. And so in this case, uh, you know, we need that virtual certainty. Right. And right. he said the ball wiggled, but he said, I don't think it moved, but, you know, it, and I said, if it, so if a ball oscillates, it, you know, by definition is not moved. So in that case, I said, you know, no penalty, play the ball as it lies, because right. we had no other evidence. Right. So I have a question that you'll both have had direct experience with, and I know I did, and I have a strong opinion on this, which I'll keep out for now. <laughs> Um, and that's the bedside manner or the or the walk or the procedure of assigning officials. So um, you have both worked many championships, many of which as a walking official and many now as a zone official. Um, and I'm going to give you, Bob, first crack at this one. Tell us your experience with both uh, and why you feel or maybe you, you one is better than the other. And maybe you can explain a little bit how that works and how the old days of officiating and have kind of changed. Yeah. And prior to five years ago, Christy, when did they change that? 
four years ago. That sounds about right. That sounds about right. Yeah. Five years ago, whenever we went to an open, whether it be a women's open or a senior open or the U.S. Open, we walked with a group. We were assigned a group, and we walked with that group all day. And by the way, just a quick, that was also true in the Open Championship. Have they also, by the way, gone to zone officiating? I don't they? know because I okay. haven't worked one in a while. But okay. at that point when I had made, had that ruling with the men, is we were walking. Right. With, okay. With Sorry, Bob. Keep going. No. And uh, and so and, – and, and, and also um, – now we're staged on a, a certain holes, or sometimes it's two holes. At the NCAA, uh, we drive a cart, and we, we have two or three groups, and we're between the groups. And so um, it's a little bit being with a group, but not quite. Um, but when you're – and now as I at the USJ events, we are stationed on a hole. And um, – and except in you know when a when an amateur one of the amateur events like the um, U.S. Amateur did once it gets to match play each match will have its right. own referee which is a little bit different in match play but you know the one thing about I enjoyed walking with the players a little more um, it's uh, you're you're with them you're seeing everything that they do um, you're noticing little habits you know their pre-shot routines and you know how they're marking the ball I mean you're paying attention and and you're focused in on you know anything that can happen there you're you're there to help and and you know more than anything else you're there to assist the players mm-hmm. to you know to help them with the rules now and and now we're in in on holes which sometimes it's a little bit harder to um, to know exactly what happened, but I know one of the main reasons the USJ, you know, went to that was um, because they they felt like um, the, some of the players felt like if you have a, if you have an official watching you, it's like Big Brothers mm-hmm. watching you. So you the, know, and the other reason that that they indicated back then was that they were actually getting audience call-ins, people calling in saying. What do you got? Why are you guys following the players? What you know? Did mm-hmm. are you just waiting for them to do something wrong? It's kind of like again, Big Brother. Yeah, the optics were not the optics friendly. weren't yeah. quite what they wanted them yeah. to be. Although I, I'll still to this day say that Mike Davis said you can you can never do a better job than walking with a group as a referee. You, you just being right there, right watching every move. That's that's the best way to officiate. And you know, of course, they they switch that. So, so, do you? What do you think? You've done both. You've seen the the overall championship and how it's conducted, not just your personal experience. That's the part that I find frustrating. It's like I had more fun walking. Well, right. it's not about you, right? It's That's, not about you. <laughs> the other argument for walking officials that I know Mike was a was a believer in was pace of play, um, because you are now developing a, a rapport if you're good at it, or at least a presence with the players that they may listen to you and say, hey, particularly if you handle it in a really diplomatic way, hey, guys, the group in front of us was just put on the clock, just want to let you know, let's keep our position, being proactive. You can't do that as a zone official. Right. You know, I, I think we do a fine job either way, Ed. Um, and and to have the players, I, I think on a collegiate level, the players like when we're walking with mm-hmm. them. I, I'm not sure the pros really appreciated that. And so I'm sure they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Ed, you make a good point. You know, it's it's not about us. It's about you know the players and the players' experience, and quite frankly, getting the rules right. But yeah. I, I agree with you. Well, so when I had the good fortune of working the Masters, I was very nervous, uh, having worked a couple of U.S. Opens. This was you know the Masters, um, and I was. And I never worked an open as a zone official, so I was I was sort of prepared for that experience at the Masters, knowing I was a pretty good idea. I wasn't going to be walking with groups because I'd watched enough Masters to know that's not the case. My problem with the walking official, when I got to sites and they handed me those hole by hole notes, and particularly when I I got better at ignoring them because frankly it is like Bob said, you got all the cabling, all the Everything down, you're talking about 20 pages of notes, <laughs> a full page at least, maybe page and a half on every single hole. And you get there and you're supposed to have walked the entire golf course. And you have, I was so nervous the entire time as a walking official because every single shot, I'm like staring at my hole by hole notes. If a shot went off the fairway, okay, what do I got? What do I got? And 
when you're a zone official, and this is where I guess I feel strongly, I, I felt more competent and more prepared. I could get out there an hour ahead of time, being a the kind of personality, anxious personality type. I could put a ball on anywhere and go, and then even get on. Hey, bring it over. Hey, what, what do you think about this? So I just felt so much more comfortable and prepared to make good rulings and to be more and not have to get on the radio. Not that I, so those, that was sort of my personal experience. Particularly in the case of these temporary immovable obstructions, because a lot of times you're measuring what's the center Mm -hmm. of this temp of this TIO. I'm going to abbreviate TIO Mm -hmm. so that I know if a ball's here, I'm going to go to that side. I know if the ball's here, I'm going to go to that side. If it's not an either side relief. So, I mean, you can do some prep work, to get ready for potential rulings. And so I, yeah. I, I agree with that point wholeheartedly. You, yeah. get, you get to be an expert on that hole. Yeah. Um, and the other great thing f- from an officiating standpoint is you see every group come through. So you're seeing every player in the field where if you're walking, those are your players, you know, two or three players that you're going to spend the day with. And so I think there's pros and cons both way, but I, I really don't have a problem being on a hole. I think that we do a fine job. <laughs> and and Ed, Ed, you're exactly right that, you know, the holes that you have, especially at the open, you go out there early and you, you know, run through in your mind, okay, if the ball's here, mm-hmm. where are we going to be dropping it? And if the ball comes here, where do you want to go drop it? Because one thing I've learned through the years is the players don't need a rules lesson. The players want to know, where do I yeah. drop the ball? Right, if right. If they're one question, where am I going to drop it? I want right. to go back and play. But I agree with Christy. I, I think, you know, being a, a, a zone official – you know, we still do a great job, and I think um, it, it's it's worked well. One last sort of uh, compare and contrast between U.S. Opens and the Masters. The thing that was a real sort of aha moment for me at the Masters was, oh, there are no TIOs here. There really are incredibly few, and they're way out of play. And all the permanent infrastructure that's there that just it's it's the advantage of having a home game exactly. every every year as opposed to having to erect the city. The you know this rodeo that you're a circus that comes to town, that makes officiating a lot easier in Augusta. It does. Yeah. The other thing that's easy about Pinehurst, there, there were no penalty areas other than one on 16, which was off the right off the tee. Yeah. So we had no yellow yeah. or red penalty areas. Yeah. I mean, kind of odd, isn't it, to have a whole golf course no. with no. <laughs> Yeah, no penalty. I have one quick story about Piner. So the USAM was there, um, 2009, I think, the year Danny Lee won, and Mike Davis said, "Make sure you review the what I'll call the two and two by two local rule with sprinkler heads, because there, there's that's ubiquitous here at yeah. Piner." So. I figured I don't need to look at that. I, I mean, I, you know, I'll have another beer at the cocktail party and they'll be fine. Um, so the next day, of course, I was on 17 green and a guy waved me down to 16 green. And that, of course, was the ruling. And I confidently made the ruling. And then he asked, do I get a club length? And I'm like, oh, crap. I just had a blank. And again, the rules have changed now. Sure. Um, but at the time, the answer was no. And I sheepishly got on the radio and I said, uh, I need a backside rover. And of course it was Mike Davis and he recognized my voice and he said, Ed, what do you need? I said, well, <clears throat> I didn't do my homework. Does he get a club length? And he laughed and said, no, he, he does not get a club length. And we moved on. And that's where I call it your Motorola rights, because we all know these are rules experts from around the world that are on that radio listening to everything that's said. And it's intimidating. I'm not even worried about the TV as much as the people right, listening right, on the judging radio. judging you. <laughs> Who was that? Who asked yeah. that question? Yeah. <laughs> and then you'll know you'll get some friendly ribbing. Um, so, and again, I don't want to, I don't want to embarrass anybody. So as an example of that, last year at the open, mm-hmm. uh, there was a mistake made and we won't, Go into details on who it was. Other than it was not me. It wasn't people, anybody in this room. People thought it was me. I'm like, yeah. no, it was not me. Yeah, yeah. So what we're talking about, this was Rory McIlroy. I believe it was uh, 14 or 15. Um, do you remember the hole, Bob? It was the uh, the part five. It was 14. 14, his ball embedded. And by the way, I just have to say, and that's why I love doing this podcast, because I can get on soapboxes anytime I want. I don't like that. I don't like that rules change. I don't like the club length you get when a ball embeds. It, it to me, it's it's um, it, it's basically get it to get out of jail free. Not to get in out that of particular j- case is definitely. But it, I've seen it happen way. now many many times yeah. where a player gets that additional club length. But anyway, the error that was made, and I'll just set it up, and maybe you can shed some light on 
how this came about and maybe some things that happened that we're not aware of. But uh, Rory's ball embedded in the, in the grass face, so it's not in the bunker, but in the grass face above the bunker, and it was embedded, which I doubt personally. I doubt that ball was embedded because you're talking U.S. Open rough, vertical face. I know enough about gravity. It's very unlikely that ball was embedded. And I always, in we grass. don't have, in grass. I mean, here's the plane of the earth. That's embedded. I don't think the plane of the earth was affected by that ball. That's, a, that's just a, another quick soap, soapbox. So anyway, but embedded ball. So the relief that was granted, as I understand it, what should have been measured from right behind the ball on that vertical face, but it was measured at the top of the, you know, like taking disregarding about 18 inches or so of distance, albeit vertical distance. So the, the effective result was the ball was dropped in the wrong, potentially in the wrong place. Yes. So, so Ed, yeah, what, what we're talking about is the rule previous to the change was that in an embedded ball, you got relief and dropped it right behind right the behind ball. Right behind the ball. Right behind the no ball. Club now length. there's a reference point right behind the ball, and you get one club length around in your semicircle. And so that's no closer to no the closer. Ball. And so that ball of Rory's embedded in that face. And so the question is, was there any ground behind the ball? You know, mm -hmm. it was, depends how the earth curves. And the rules official on site did not think that there was, that there, the reference point really wasn't behind the ball. And there's a new clarification that says, if there's not a reference point directly behind the ball and the reference point cannot be in the bunker, it must be in the general area, then you find your nearest point in the general area, which becomes the reference point, mm -hmm. correct? And so the she, who's a, one of our closest friends, and let me just say, she is a great rules official. Just yeah. on that particular time, made a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. She didn't get she didn't get in position to make the ruling properly. I think her mistake was she stayed on top of the bunker yeah. and felt around. Right. She didn't get in the bunker to see. Yeah. You know, level. Right. What was behind that? Right. Right. But you know, going back to being nervous. You know, you're on the 14th hole at, oh, the, yeah. at the open. There's so many cameras, and well, you've got and the Rory's lead. And Rory's in the hunt. Yeah, yeah. And Rory's yeah. in the hunt. That's, and, as, that's as uh, big a spotlight as you're ever going to find. And, and what I had heard, and again, who knows if this is true, but I can totally see. You mentioned with Neil Shipley, you're trying to break through on the radio, and you can't get through. So maybe she asked for a rover, and I can't get a rover. Um, and if, you know, I I think I think I said I'm going to. She avoid had her earpiece out. They were trying to talk to her. Ah, okay. And she had her earpiece out. While, and a lot of people pull it out. They they they, they yeah, told us, you're, do not pull out your earpiece while you're trying to make a ruling. We yeah. may be trying to get in touch with you. Yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I it, it, because you know, Ed, when you're making rulings, especially when you got TV, and mm -hmm. they're yapping on the radio about something else. Mm -hmm. It can be, you're, you're trying to focus in on what you're doing. No, exactly. And, 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 and you want to get your full attention to the, to the player and, and listen to what they're saying and so forth. But um, at the, it just, but at the end of the day, she allowed Rory, the reference point, which was uh, not where it should have been. And, and Rory uh, was able to drop it 18 inches closer mm -hmm. to the, the hole or I think eight determined it was 12 inches but it doesn't regardless he had a better he had a better all i know is feet. all i know is ruling correct or not um you know because again the the statement the usj put out and we don't have to dwell on this anymore was that it really didn't affect now it might have affected the the uh, the, the stance uh instead of having to stand he ended up making bogey um, but again, I really don't yeah. like that, that rule anymore. Cause I do think it, it presents too many opportunities for a get out of jail free. Um, okay. So it's a little transition here into <laughs> another fun question. Do you find that most rules officials now are friendly and have a, their attitude is I'm here to help not, um, they're kind of a little bit more this is about me and i'm i've risen to the top of my game and i need respect or what, what is your my take on the group that we associate with is that the younger they are the more friendly and the the, the a different approach mm -hmm. is taken i think some of the old school guys are still pretty st stoic mm -hmm. and don't approach it i mean i always 
walk up to a player and say, how can I help? That's my first question. Right. How can I help? Right. That's what I'm, you know, that's what I'm there to do is yeah. to help them. And uh, I don't think that's the same approach that some of the other guys use. I don't know, Bob, do you have an opinion? Yeah. You know, Lou, Lou Blakey, who is uh, a tremendous mentor of mine, you know, always, always said, walk into a ruling slowly and confidently and, and, and ask in a very nice, slow way. You know, he's, he always says, may I be of assistance? And that's what Lou would always say. And he said, you know, it's important to, to approach each rule like, hey, you're here to help. You're not rushing through it. Um, and, and I think it is, uh, I, I think it is important to be, you know, friendly and, and the player really believes that you're trying to help them. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, Christy, too, in terms of the the general trend. Um, there was a gotcha mentality, I think, in the past of, you know, tough luck. Bad luck starts somewhere, <laughs> stops right here. You know, right. some of these one-liners that, you know, are, again, as a, at, at the cocktail hour afterward, kind of this braggadocia of how I denied this player relief and look yeah. at me. And um, speaking of that, um, as far as, how to tell a player bad news. Um, and maybe you have your own ideas on this. I was watching a European tour event one morning early, and I don't know who the official was, but a player was asking for relief, much like uh, Angela Jimenez, and the official was not able to grant relief. And he said, there's nothing I can do for you under the rules. And I put that in my little toolkit, and I said, you know, that might be useful someday. And I've used it a couple, not often, but because that's a wonderfully friendly way of saying I'm gonna, I'm here to help you, but I'm not gonna cheat for you. Right. Yeah. What's our button say that? Yeah, we have a button. Jim Moriarty, our Fed, gave us his button. We wore it a lot of college tournaments. It's not personal. It's the rules of golf. <laughs> <laughs> so we have. We did not wear it at the USG events. No. But, yeah, they're but, probably proud of that. But yeah. the, the 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 guy that's the second in charge of the NCAA rules gave it to us. So we we felt and we got some comments on that button. Oh, they, the players actually liked that. I like that. Uh, the coaches that did too. Good. Yeah, they that's, thought that was funny. That is good. <laughs> My very first rules seminar, one of my first, Ken Lindsay did, and he said, you know, I've been doing offici I've been officiating for however many years, 30 years. I've never given a penalty. And everybody looked at him like he's crazy, and he says, that's because every time I issue a penalty, and he held up the rules book, this little book gives the penalty. <laughs> and he was a big advocate of not using personal pronouns. And that's there's something to be said for that. It's not I am denying you relief. There's no interference. That's just, yeah. there's nothing personal there. It's just, and these are the kinds of things you get better at with experience. Sure. And, you know, Great. and that's true. And, you know, one of the things about going to these, some of these events that we go to is, you know, the discussions that we have with the other rules officials. And, you know, I, I think, you know, we go to an open, every official there I could learn something from, and, yeah. you know, and, and we talk about little things like that and you know had this ruling or had that rule sometimes it's drives christy i could talk more more rules of the shop that christy can christy drives her crazy a little more but but you're always learning just from other yeah. player you know like that was interesting what you just said yeah. i'm gonna put that in my uh in my book too <laughs> yeah yeah um the uh, you know, another. I had a great conversation with Andy McPhee, who was oh, a tour uh, official. Loved the, uh, Andy. Yeah, and he told me something really interesting. I'd love to get your both of your takes on this, which kind of surprised me. Because the other thing I sort of noticed: the more experience you had, the more, and maybe this is not correct, the more likely it was that you might inch over the line of advice. Um, and because I have always been so black and white on advice and really I can't, there's what, what you can and can't say as an official is a really, it gets delicate at times because you really know, you know, you really shouldn't be dropping there because it's going to end up over here. So how much coaching can you give a player? And Andy told me, and then the summary of this was, there's nothing wrong with walking a player through a rules scenario. And he basically was saying, we're going to go from here to here to here, and if you're leading the witness a little bit, you know you've a, he he sees a multi-drop thing, you know a TIO that's going to lead to a new condition, and he would have no problem saying here we're going to go from here to here to here and to here, and it was pretty clear that the way you made some decisions might you, know, you could you cut to the chase. A, yeah, you yeah. might go to a different way. If you, I I guess my and I think Bob uses this same approach is at, particularly at the collegiate level. Um, 
you go and you look at the scenario and the, the player's just, he has one thought in his mind and that is, well, I have to drop it here and that's not good and then I'm going to have to go back. And he's walking through these things out loud with you and, and you just say, would you like to know your options under the rules? Mm-hmm. Because there's other options. Yeah. You know, you yeah. want him to know you're, yeah. you're not thinking this clearly. Yeah. Let me, yeah. and usually they say, well, yes. And so you'll yeah. go through his two or three options. And then, then it's kind of like, yeah. oh, he'll, yeah. you know, the light bulb you, goes off. Yeah. 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 Ed, we've, we've all seen situations. The player will ask you, can you drop here? But, you know, it's much better to take another options. One of the other options under the, whatever rule it is, but, uh, for my high school team, I, you know, I always say when you call a, a, a rules official or you bring someone in, always don't ask anything specific. Ask, what are my options under the rules of golf? That's the question you ask every time. Mm-hmm. And, and so I've, you know, I don't know if my players are listening to me, but that is certainly something that, you know, I've taught them to say because yeah. I think that's the right thing to say. Well, I'll give you, again, not to dwell on this one, but the example that comes to mind for me, let's say you have a ball that enters the penalty area and abutting that penalty area is a card path. And you're going to have a two drought drop process. And there's a little bit of grass on either side of it. And that little bit of grass is good or it's bad, you know, and, and so there's a good side of the path and a bad side of the path. And a, a smart player will measure their two club lengths and drop knowing it's going to roll more than two club lengths or I'm sorry, roll outside, there I am yeah. using my old hat, hat. <laughs> rolling outside of the, the area, and then they're going to get to place it, and now we have a new situation, and where they place that ball could have a big difference. And I'm wow. sort of like biting my tongue to say, I drop it over here at this edge, because I know where this is going, and they may or may not. Yeah. Um, so that's where, and those don't happen a lot, but there are definitely times you have well, to be Andy's, careful. Well, Andy's approach is fine, yeah. I think. Yeah. We're going to go here. And yeah. We're gonna go here. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Get it? Yeah. And if they're not, if they're not smart enough to figure that out. Right. Okay. Yeah, when, when you have those two-step rulings, a lot of times they say, "Well, can I just drop it over yeah. here?" You no. Know? <laughs> Sorry. We had that at, at uh, La Costa all the time on on eighteen, where the penalty mm-hmm. area is the cart path. Line. Yeah. And so yeah. we're dropping on the cart path, and then we're and yeah. the players are like, "Why are we doing yeah. this?" I said, "Well." <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Maybe we'll shorten that someday, but yeah. Okay. Um, next topic: rules that you would change if you were king or queen. Mm. Um, I have my list of things. Um, so as you think about, because I didn't prep you for this, um, one and this isn't a rule I would change. It would be a rule I would adopt more widely. And that I was at Rolling Hills this morning. They wanted some. Uh, input on some course markings, mm. uh, which involved a round of golf, which was really fun too. Nice. Yeah. I don't always get to do that. And, um, you know, I wish more courses, more clubs would use the alternative to stroke and distance local rule. Cause I think it's a really smart local rule. You lose a ball, measure equidistant into the fairway and drop within two club lengths. And Oh, by the way, it's two strokes. You're not getting, that's not, and it preserves the outcome in most cases of what would have been a provisional ball played under stroke and distance. So that's a rule that exists that I would just adopt more widely. I do have some others that I, I would but change. But the players don't use that, Ed. I mean, they think I'm adding two strokes. I know they don't. And I don't know if that's because again, for years players have been doing that and adding one, one. stroke. Yeah. And then guess what? They still do. When I was on the rules committee, Friendly when games. that, when, because when the rules committee first presented their, I'll call it 1.0. And I was on early in the 2019 run up and Mark Newell, brilliant guy, really enjoyed working with him, um, presented to the executive team at the USGA. And Mike Davis said, what about the alternative to stroke and distance? And at the time, he said, we, we haven't come up with anything. And, and Mike was not happy. He said, I think you need to put your thinking cap back on. And there were so many different ideas offered. And I think it's a really elegant solution. I mean, it's yeah. not perfect, um, but we're estimating all the time in golf where balls last cross – it's not like that's a concept that doesn't already exist. So use that same concept. Bring but the ball it's not back. where it lasts cross. It's where they think the ball no, is. No, I, I understand. But that's that's fairly... In desert golf, we have no idea. Yeah. A lot yeah. of times we have yeah. no idea. Or yeah. it's a dog leg. Well, again, no for pace idea. of play and for getting for around that. the golf course. Now, is it going to use it in a high-level competition? No. But at the club level, I think it's a great local rule. 
Anything come to mind that you might change? You know, a, a couple of them they changed this year, which um, would have been on my list a year ago, was uh, now if the committee puts the wrong handicap on a scorecard. Right. It used to be that was the player's responsibility, and the player could get disqualified for that. Well, now um, – now uh, that it, it's the, the committee can correct that, yeah. even in scoring, and it's yeah. not so much the onus on the player. The player still certainly has a responsibility, but that, and you know, they also are easing up. There's a local rule, one of the local rules. By the way, there's 92 local rules now. Wow. Seven, there's 75 pages of local rules. I think, yeah. I think if my numbers aren't exact, they're pretty close. But, you know, one of the other ones was now that you can write a local rule that if you've left a scoring area, you're yeah, not. They just announced that. Uh, I just saw a, a Craig Winter email just go out this last week. That And that's smart. Yeah. With it, you know, because, uh, again, just to make sure everybody understands what we're talking about, it used to be, or it still is, I guess, because this is a local rule, that as soon as you leave the quote-unquote scoring area, that that scorecard is officially turned in, and if it's there's an error, you're too de- too bad. We saw that happen with Jordan Spieth earlier this year. Yes. Now it's if a error, you have 15 minutes. The local rule says that you have 15 minutes from the time it was, I guess, input into the computer. Is that yeah? I, I yeah, I, I'd yeah. have to yeah. yeah. But, but anyway, yeah. that, it's, that it's, makes, it's a little bit of get out of jail. It's it's you know you take one step over the line, yeah. you know you're not necessarily yeah. DQ'd because that's that's always been a. You know, when you're disqualifying a player, that is a harsh penalty. Yeah, yeah. You know, one thing that they actually, when I was on the rules committee, I hated that if you, and this was an instance in one of the women's opens where a blade of sand was. Yeah. God, who was it? It was, I think it was, uh, uh, Brent, was that Brittany Lincecum? Uh, no. Um, it was a. It was a playoff. Was, and they, and again, yeah. yeah. Exact, it might have been Brittany in the playoff, but it was a European player. Oh, okay. Anyway, she. she Touched a grain of sand. She hand. didn't see it. Yeah. Didn't feel it, didn't see it visually. Yeah. And yet it, it, it impacted the outcome of that championship. Yeah. And I just said, this is not right. If yeah. a player can't even see or feel moving a blade of sand, but the high definition video can, how can we, how can yeah. we expect the player to know that? Yeah. And. Um, and you know, there's been other instances, same kind of thing though, yeah. just so minute. Oh, it, you know, back in the old days when we were in a penalty area and we mm-hmm. would touch right. a loose impediment. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. So they, now they have softened that, yeah. right. To say, no, we're not yeah. making rulings with, if we think yeah. the player cannot see or feel or, yeah. you know, with the naked eye, that right. is not a penalty. Right. But I, I, I think, Ed, too, and I'm sort of still pondering your question, but you look at, you know, the flag stick rule, how much more player friendly that is. If you're in a penalty area now, how much more player friendly that is. And and I think the USGA and, uh, has done an amazing job of of making the rules more friend, mm-hmm. player friendly. Oh, the ball uh, moving on the green. Oh, All that's those to me. Instances where the that's ball. So, that's so. That is so much. Oh, that is just re- really. Well, and so again, that's a great equitable. example. The game has evolved to the point where putting greens are like this table. I mean, they're you know. so the ball just moves so much more easily. So we needed to evolve the rule, and we were, I guess, running into this. <laughs> you you had the ruling with Neil Shipley. It, mm-hmm. We all know it was just happening way too often. Yeah. Did that ball move? What caused it to move? Now it's like. Just a bright light test. Did you put? It's it is funny though how people I don't think fully appreciate. You still need to mark it the second time. So if if you and they always do, but if you put it up to three feet and it's on a precarious spot, you better mark you it. Better to mark it. That, yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's a you know a common sense rule is that you know you own that spot. Yeah, I mean it's and it's always been that way. People when they when your ball reaches the putting green, I think there's something about um and and I'm. When when the ball's been in your hand, and you put it back, there's a there's that that's a difference than playing the ball that arrived there on its own accord and you didn't intervene. So that just there's a logic there, um, and that same logic doesn't apply when the ball's not on the putting green. Um, yeah, but right. it's it, you know the the it, when Christy chaired the rules of golf committee, she. You know, I remember the one of her big one was if if you can't see it, you shouldn't be penalized. Yeah. You know, kind of that naked eye standard. And yeah. you know, well, and, and I, I I want to clarify that it's it's the player. You know, said they didn't see it. Well, maybe they weren't looking. But I'm talking about a situation where the player is addressing the ball, looking at it, 
seeing it, and, yeah. and there's an incident like the blade of sand, which yeah. was just ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, we fixed that. Yeah. So, yeah. And, but you know, it's interesting on not you know all the rules. I was on the putting green with Martin Laird two days ago, and uh, and Martin uh, was with his kids, and and uh, you know Martin kind of pulled me over and went through this whole thing about how we shouldn't be able to fix damage on the putting green. And that it gives players advantage, and they make troughs all the way to the to the hole, and it delays play. And uh, you know, Martin, and you know, he's obviously got credibility, but yeah. uh, you know, he he certainly was bending my ear. He didn't like that. That's, That's no, he, he, like he, that. Yeah. he did not like that rule rules change. He, he, so he he was uh, anyway. I heard his all his reasons. Yeah, that is interesting because that was always the fear. Uh, about allowing players to tap down spike marks uh, was that they would create this sort of trough. And you do see now, Xander Shoffley, every time his ball comes to rest near the hole, the first thing he does before he even marks it is tap, tap down, tap tap. tap, 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 tap. It's just like, I'm going to make yeah. sure uh, there's not yeah. anything in there. So, so you know, the, the, the rules will always... Uh, you know, you sat on the rules of golf committee. You know, it's the, the there's always going to be different sides of different rules. Yeah. <laughs> so, Bob, you'd mentioned earlier you had a chance during the open to see some of our local talent that have uh, come up. It's been so much fun to see Jennifer Cupcho. Obviously, Wyndham Clark is the defending champion in the open. Um, just love to hear what that experience was. Well, you know, Wyndham, Wyndham Clark um, is uh, saw me at the open. I actually walked out and and um, I said, good luck, Wyndham. And he stopped. He turned around. He must have recognized my voice. He said, thanks, Bob. How you doing? And I said, good. And I said, good luck. I didn't really get too much of a chance to talk to him. But, you know, um, I've known Wyndham since he's been eight or nine years old. And, and you know, when he was a high school player at Valor, um, he came and played in a couple of my Kent Denver invites and uh, was always gracious enough to do that. He, he didn't play in too many. And you know, he's just a, a local kid, and I have never, I've said this a hundred times, I, I've never seen a kid at 11, 12, and 13, 14-year-olds work that hard on his game. Yeah. He was so motivated and so dedicated and, you know, so, so proud of what he's done. And, you know, he just made the Olympic team. Is that official? Yes, that is official. Uh, wow. Xander and Scotty and Colin Montgomery and Wyndham are officially yeah, yeah. named. Mark Howard. Uh, Mark, how what did I yeah, say? Yeah. Montgomery. <laughs> I don't know where I got that, but they're yeah. they're they've been uh, they will play for the United That's States amazing. in the Olympics, wow. which is what which a... is a great thing. And you know Jennifer Cupcho, um, certainly you could argue she's the best women player to ever come out <laughs> yeah. of Colorado, yeah. and what she's accomplished not only at the college level but you know at the pro. And you know one thing you know Wyndham, which goes a little bit under the radar. In college, he was there five years, but one year he was Big 12 Player of the Year. Yeah. And that's a great conference, Texas, Texas State, and Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. And, the, and another year he was Pac-12 yeah. Player There's of the Year. There's probably not many players that can say that. <laughs> I mean, yeah. That's all right. Well, this has been every bit as much fun as I thought it would be, so much so I'm going to definitely have you back again. But before we um, adjourn, I would love just open mic. Christy, you've had a wonderful career uh, are you just anything else that I haven't asked you if I that you'd like to share or, um, in all your experiences? You know, I think the longer Bob and I do this and, and we're doing more and more together, um, the more we enjoy giving back to the game. I mean, it's really we have time. You know, we're, we're both retired. We love the game. We love playing the game. But more than that, we love our friendships and we love these championships. Uh, we love the staff at the USGA. So, mm -hmm. you know, just rekindling all those relationships and being able to see the best players in the world or the best players coming up in the world mm -hmm. is truly a gift and really, really, really fun for us. Yeah, I feel the same way. You know, every championship you work, um, you feel, first of all, you know, to, to most of them with my wife is certainly a blessing. Um, and But from the, you know, the golf that you witness, but just to ex experience that, but also the friendships and and to be able to to get to know the USJ staff and the the, the you know Thomas Pagel and Pete who you mentored uh, were there and and to rekindle and talk about those and you become very we we've gotten to be very good friends with a, a number of our our, our officials and um, um, it's oh, I, it, thought, I thought of one other benefit we. We've been able to go to places we would have mm. never traveled to. We've gone. We've been to 
uh, Abu Dhabi, mm-hmm. been to Paris or, or Versailles for the mm-hmm. World Amateur Team. We're going to La Hinch for the Palmer Cup. Wow. I mean, so we're doing all these. Very yeah, you know, cool but but also Ed, trips. it's given me. I went to Bowling Green, Kentucky, for a girls' junior, and I went well, to Stevens Point. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah that's right. I yeah. you were there, Ed. I but, love those places too. But you know, you go to exactly Bowling Green, mean. Kentucky, and you know how proud their community oh, is. Yeah. And, and, you know, how they embrace these. In that case, it was the girls' junior. Yeah. How much they embrace those. And we've been to a number of those little towns. Oh, yeah. That you, you go there and you say, you know, these are these are just great towns and great people. And you get to know them and you go to restaurants and you go to all these places. It's, no, it's I, quite I, that's, I'm so glad you mentioned that. I completely agree. The best part of my time doing uh, rules officiating for USJ championships was exactly what you're saying. Senior opens in the old days when they had a transportation committee and these volunteers in their Lexus would take you wherever you wanted to go. And you'd have a nice little Uber driver uh, who, you know, going to Dayton, Ohio, um, going to Hutchinson, Kansas, and just getting to know those communities and the people is so Special, and that made that definitely is the part of it that I probably enjoyed the most. I have one funny anecdote that uh, I'll share that with Jim Bunch that he tells uh, very better than I do. But I, th- before I tell you that little story, it's a lot of work. I, I think you guys do it as a labor of love, but I don't think people appreciate it's a lot of work, and you're out there a long time, and it's hot. And <laughs> and let's be honest, not everybody loves you. You're out there, and you're often the bad guy, even if you do it in a friendly way. You're dealing with pace of play. You're dealing with parents who are in your ear about how could you possibly Coaches. Coaches, yeah. exactly. <laughs> it is a lot of work, and you're doing it. You're not getting paid. I don't know of any other official in any other sport that does it for free. So it's it's one of the most amazing things about golf. In that it, way. It, you know, you're right, Ed, that – you know, with our friends, they see you're standing and you're watching golf at the U.S. Open. But the work it took to get there, and I listened to your podcast with Lewis mm-hmm. about how hard he studies and how long he prepares for the rules of golf, the mm-hmm. the uh, three day uh, rules of golf workshops. And, you know, I'm. I was trying to get some tips, and I got some tips from him. Yeah. But you know, because I do the same thing he does, yeah. and we all do. And you know, but he, and he he did a great job of talking about how much work it takes just to prepare academically. Yeah. And then when you're out there, how much work it is. And that alarm that. goes off at four thirty, and oh my goodness, it's yeah. it's it's not and easy. You're, and you're yeah. there all day, and then it's Luckily, like I'm up. I'm an early bird. And, and you're there all day, and then, and then you're going home, and you're starved, but you don't want to eat a big dinner because you got. It's true. You, you, it's got, like six o'clock at night. You've had your fourth rain delay, and you're like, oh, oh man, am I ever going to eat tonight? And we we have a saying as a rules official: sleep fast. <laughs> <laughs> well, the story I alluded to. So Jim Bunch, like you, Christy, was thrust into the uh, as an executive committee member with very little rules experience. And he's on the 16th green at Augusta, and it's his first year. And it was a pretty benign day, and he's sitting inside the ropes um, in his little Augusta chair, making sure he's not in the view of the camera, as we're instructed. And these guys are just having a great old time, and they're stacking up the beers. And, you know, Augusta, they're pretty well behaved, but they were not they were not la- they were not feeling any pain. And they 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 started yucking it up with Jim, and Jim is so friendly. He's you know, giving it right back to him. And they said, so what do you, what do you have to do to become, to get your job? And Jim, without missing a beat said, well, the first rule is you can't drink beer. And that was the end of that conversation. <laughs> that's so, classic Jim. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's, yeah. He uh, you that know, that off, the, off the cuff. It may look like fun, but you can't drink beer. So <laughs> that would not be good. Well, listen, thank you guys for this hour, whatever it's been, it's flown by. Um, and I hope we can do this again. Yeah, so. sure. Thank you, Ed. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for having us. You bet. <laughs>